reception that it did receive. But we have an added extra plus as part of the evening tonight. And one of my favorite, favorite people as as people, <laughs> not just as a as a talented person, but just as a wonderful person is here tonight. And that's Edvige Danticat, who's going to give the introduction for Marlon. Uh, but I want to say one thing about Edvige. You know, we all know her for the great books that she writes for all of us. But this coming fall, she's written two books for some of us who are like maybe this big. She's got a wonderful book, a middle grade reader book coming out. And then I saw today this remarkable uh, picture book that is for kids much younger. And so this is going to be her year of the kid. So we're really excited to have Ed Veach here tonight and keep an eye out for those books. And please give her a really, really warm welcome. Ed Veach, time to come. Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight in the house and online. Um, it's an honor to introduce Marlon James. And I won't keep it long so you, you can get right to hearing him. Some writers seem to emerge fully formed. Your Salman Rushdie's, your Zadie Smith, your Marlon James. Marlon has been making waves since the publication of his astonishing first novel, John Crow's Devil, which was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and the Commonwealth Writers Prize. Reading back now, it's hard to believe that this was a debut novel. It feels epic in the way it turns a small Jamaican village's religious conflicts into a hypnotic and nuanced meditation on identity, self-determination, and a battle between good and evil that would stand beside some of those written by the ancient Greeks for their demagogues. When that book was first published in 2010, Marlin was compared to everyone from Toni Morrison to William Faulkner to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and that has never stopped. Marlin's sophomore novel, The Book of Night Women, showed no sign of the famous sophomore slump. Set on the Jamaican sugar plantation at the turn of the 19th century, it digs painfully deep into the gruesome realities of slavery in our hemisphere. Reviewing it for the New York Times, the scholar Kaima Glover wrote, quote, Marlon James' second novel is both beautifully written and devastating, while the gruesome history of slavery in the Americas is a story we may dare to think we already know. Every page of the Book of Night Women reminds us that we don't know nearly enough, end quote. The Book of Night Women won the 2010 Dayton Literary Peace Prize and the Minnesota Book Award, and was a finalist for an NAACP Image Award, as well as a National Book Critics Circle Award in fiction. Tonight, Mullen will read from and discuss his most recent novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings. Named a best book of the year by every remaining newspaper and magazine in this country that still covers books, <laughs> including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Time, and Newsweek magazines, this brilliant and ambitious novel takes us on a charged, tumultuous, and absorbing ride through Jamaica over several deca decades. When this book is talked about, you will most often hear about The Singer, the character based on Bob Marley. However, you will also meet a whole slew of other unforgettable characters written in Marlin's gripping and startling prose and in a multiplicity of irresistible voices. The New York Times' Michiko Kakutani, not one to hand out compliments casually, <laughs> called the book monumental, sweeping, mythic, and exhilarating. The Wall Street Journal called it a tour de force. The Los Angeles Times called it thrilling. Over the course of his career, Marlin has thrilled, astonished, delighted, amazed, enlightened, and frankly, frightened the heck out of us, his readers. And he continues to do so, each time better than the last. Marlon comes to us tonight by way of Jamaica, where he was born in 1970, and in, in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he now teaches literature and creative writing at McAllister College. He also spends quite a bit of time here, as Mitchell just said. Please give us a warm Books and Books welcome to Marlon James. Ooh. 
I'm trying not to geek out in presence of writing heroes. <laughs> I, 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 I did a couple of months ago, actually a couple of weeks ago, I had to introduce Claudia Rankin. And I haven't sounded like a teenager in years. <laughs> so the more I talk about Edwidge, I'll probably start to sound like a fanboy. So <laughs> but thank you so much for that fantastic introduction. It's, it's, I'm so humbled by it. It's, um, you know, I, I, still, I teach, I, it's funny, I teach deep dew breaker every semester. Um, and uh, there's so much about it. And um, in, in my writing class, um, Edwidge is, has a fantastic essay in the creative, create dangerous a collection about um, the criticism she gets when characters are, when we expect our characters to be representative of our countries, where they're supposed to play the role of sort of unofficial tourist board members. <laughs> and um, when Edwidge Ed says, she always thought her characters are only accountable to themselves and responsible to themselves. And what a big moment that is for Caribbean literature and a way to, and to look at Caribbean characters. That's something that you know, I sort of have to take as advice almost daily, so thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna read a few sections from, from the book. Uh, brief history is not brief, and there are a little more than seven killings. <laughs> but a hundred killings sound like I was trying too hard to be Gabriel Garcia Marquez. So. <laughs> You can't, you can't go near 100 years of solitude. We'll know what you're doing. Um, so I'm going to read from a few, few characters. Uh, one of the, the first character I'm going to read from is Demos. I'm trying to, to, to go into different time periods. The book is set in five different time periods, one or two days apart. First, two, year, two days in 1976, and then it jumps to 1985. No, to 1979, it jumps to 1985, and it jumps to 1991. Each section is one day. The 1979 section is actually five minutes. It's an Andy Gibbs song playing twice. So this is what you get when you read too much Virginia Woolf. Um, so the first character I'm going to read is Demos. And Demos is one of the seven men who tried to kill the singer. It's a year. We know it's Bob Marley. Um, so this is him right the night before. This is the house by the sea. It only have one room and is not a house, but it used to be a home. The man, who closed the, the man who closed the road to let the train pass, may not know him name, but he died in 1972 and nobody took him place. The train stopped passing when West Kingston turned into the Wild West and every man turned into cowboy. I wanted to be Jim West, but in pants too tight. The TV in the Chinese shop black and white, but I guess that in pants is blue, a girl blue. This is a house that is one room, and the man who used to live here sleep on a sponge and shit in a bucket and that he wash out in the sea. Nobody remember him name. This is the color of the room. The room paint in five color that cut short. Red from the floor to the bottom of the window. Green from the bottom of the window to the ceiling. Blue on the next wall, reach the ceiling but run out before it reached the corner. Pink that start the third wall and cover it green at the bottom of the fort. This is what it must be like for a man to grow, up with, grow old without a woman. Do we forget him parts and sad every time he have to piss for that remind him? Or do we play with himself like some pervert? This is the one chair in the room, a red chair with dainty legs. Dainty is a word from a poem we learn in school. Lovely dainty Spanish needle with your yellow flower and white. Do you be decked and softly sleeping? Do you think of me tonight? This is the first mistake God make. Time. God was a fool to create time. It's the one thing that even he run out, of, run out of. But me beyond time. Me in the now, which is now, which is also then. Then is also soon, and soon might as well be if. Two men just come in the house making seven nine. One from Rima, two from Trenchtown, three from Jungle, three from Copenhagen City. This is how nine, ten men turn into nine. Three nights ago, Matic from Trenchtown tried to light the cocaine the way Weeper show him, but he forget and Weeper wasn't there. A night with no moon and we with no flashlight to show the way to and from the house. Matic thinking he know how to free base and that a spoonful of cocaine is a spoonful of cocaine is a spoonful of cocaine. 
Matic think that Weeper would just leave cocaine just anywhere, so he searched the floor, in the corner, inside two cupboard near the window, in the ash of the coal stove near the door. He look and look and the other boys start looking too, feeling the cocaine itch, even though cocaine don't leave an itch, that's heroin. Matic finds some white, and when the other tried to move in for him to share it, he pull him gun out. He used him own lighter and cooked powder. He remembered to heat the cocaine in water and add the baking soda he seen in the cupboard. He smiled like a pro when all, while all the other men look at him like a hungry tiger. But Matic forget the rest. He forget the other liquid that we peruse, the ether. The sea wouldn't burn, it wouldn't change. No smoke was coming from, it, from him to smoke it, so he lick it. Lick the fire hot spoon so hard that we hear him tongue sizzle. Free base hit with a quick kick. And the kick takes eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Nothing. Fuck critics, Matic say. Then fall front way, him face slamming into the floor with a bam as his mouth start to froth. Nobody touch him until Weeper come and laugh and ask if we didn't think it funny that in a dirty, nasty shack like this, we don't have no rat. This is how nine men become eight. Last night, Joe's wheels tell me what we're going to do. Renton from Trenchtown say, him cut a hit tune and him not pulling no gun like that boy in the Heptones who in prison. He said that him baby mother go to the singer record studio and they give her money for the baby and her mother and her whole family. And he know that she's just one of the more than 100 people that get help from the singer. And what going to happen if that stop? Josie Wales say, that don't make him better, that make him worse. Because all him doing is giving poor people fish to eat. Because now that he reach, he don't want nobody else catch fish for himself. Somehow we received that reasoning, but not rent on from Trenchtown. We protect out him gun to shoot the son of a bitch right there, so. Josie Wales say, no man, listen to the man and understand him reasoning. Then Josie will say that one has to know the factors. We don't know what he mean. So he say kinetic energy, KE equal MV2 to the second power, where M is mass and V is velocity. Yaw, deformation, fragmentation, bleeding, hypovolvelmic shock, exsanguination, hypoxia, pneumothorax, heart failure, and brain damage, bang. Him skull stopped the bullet, but blood still splash on weeper chest. Not my Starsky and Hutch t-shirt, Weeper say, as the man body fall and he wipe brains off him chest. Josie Wills put the gun back in him holster. This is how the white man teach me how to load a M16. Point the rifle mu muzzle in a safe direction. Cock the rifle and open the bolt. Return the charging handle to the forward position. Place the selector level and safe. Insert the magazine, push it inward. Tap upward on the button of the magazine to ensure it's seated. Tap the forward assist to ensure that the bolt is fully forward and locked. You won't need to put, uh, put it on safe. 7 man, 21 gun, 840 bullet. I think of one man and one man only and it's not the singer. I think of him running into a wall and bawling in a high voice like a little girl. I think of him saying, it's not me you come for, who you come for downstairs. I think about the man who cheat and get away and who, the man whose luck run out. I look at him and say, this is what debt going to look like. All right. So I'm going to move on. You can clap if you want. <laughs> so one of my characters in this story is Nina Burgess. And Nina Burgess is a woman out of her luck out of her look she's from Havendale and um, so her her one of the things I really wanted to capture with this book is the different varieties of Jamaican patois that there are all of them there is you know I ask the people you know we have uptown butter too what is chupid <laughs> you know you have uptown butter uptown butter is like saying things like ta the word is thanks uh, so Nina Burgess in a lot of ways was fun to that like, because being somebody in somebody like Havendale or Doheny Park, you're right on the precipice of high and low. And you kind of have to deal with the BS of both. And uh, Nina is somebody who's caught in it. But Nina is in a very desperate situation where she needs to leave the country. It's 1976. Mike and Manley just said there are five flights to Miami. She really wants to be on one of them. 
and she's run out of, of options. So she's taken to stalking the singer. She's outside his gate, hoping to get his attention. And of course, it gains notice. So this is her waking up the first morning after pretty much stalking Marley. And she got, she's woken up by a call from her sister, Kimmy. So this whole scene is a conversation between the two of them. You know, ring, ring, ring. <laughs> Hello? Well, praise Almighty Jaja. Is all is see me finally wake up? It's third time me I call the sister in. My sister Kimmy. Two sentences in and she's already playing ghetto. I wonder if the sun is up yet. I don't know if I'm up for either it or her this morning. I was really tired. Too much party last night. You hear me? I said yeah, too much party last night. You're not going to ask him what you must take for it. If you're a Jamaican in the 70s, you know that joke. I already know. You already know what you must take? No, I already know you're about to tell me. Oh, what a way you faced this morning, sisterin. Not used to you being so smart. Must be the morning air. <laughs> Kimmy makes a point out of never calling me. Ever since she took up with Ras Trent, who told her to keep her communication with people still trapped in the Babylon shit stim as little as possible. He, he escapes such communication by flying out to New York every six weeks or so. Kim is still waiting on a visa to go with him. You'd think that Ras Trent, son of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, could arrange a visa for his queen woman. You'd think the same queen woman would read something into him not even offering to try. But everything in Jamaica is up for sale, even an American visa, and I have things to do today. How can I help you, Kimmy? I was thinking the other day, what do you know about Garveyism? You call me at... 8.45, 8.45 a.m. Nina, it's soon 9. 9, shit, I have to go to work. You don't have no job. <laughs> Still, I have to show what you know about Garveyism. Is this a radio quiz? Am I upon the ear? <laughs> Stop that things met joke. Then what else could this be? You calling me so early in the morning for no other reason than a civics lesson. My point exactly, that you wouldn't see it as important. This is why the white man just don't press you so. When we say Garvey, your ears should prick up like dog. <laughs> you talk to your mother today? She fine. That's what she said? Mommy need to levitate her life to the struggle. Only then, she can truly escape our down pressure as a people. Kimmy learning from Ras Trent to take the words English people gave her as a tool of oppression and spit them back in their face. Rastaman don't deal with, deal with negativity, so oppression is now downpression, even though there is no up in the word. <laughs> Dedicate is livicate. I and I, well, God knows what that means, but it sounds like somebody trying for their own holy trinity, but forget the name of the third person. Oh, Lord, that shit if you ask me. And too much work to remember. But nothing Kimmy likes more than being given too much work to do. Especially when Rastrent looking for probably another woman, not a queen like her, but a woman who will suck his cock and maybe eat his ass, so that his no 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 turns into oh oh oh, a bow cat he doesn't have to respect. Kimmy wants something specific, but she'll never ask, preferring to fish it out. Oh, there's there's swearing. Sorry. <laughs> this morning, who knows? Maybe she just wants to feel better than somebody, and my number is one of the few eight digits she can remember. He's a national hero, I say. At least you know that. He wanted black people to eventually go back to Africa. Well, in a way, but good, good. He was a thief who by a ship that couldn't sail nowhere, but probably not the only national hero who was a thief. See it there now? Who tell the same is thief? This is why black people can't progress, you know. They call them own people thief. I didn't know Marcus Garvey's real name is Burgess, or is our real name Garvey. This is exactly what T say. This is exactly what him said people like you would say. People like me, then the moss. People like you, people in darkness. Come out of the dark and come into the light, sisterin. Also, if you're a Jamaican from the 70s, you got that joke. <laughs> I could try to shut her up, but like Ras Trent, Kimmy's not really talking to you. She only needs a witness, not an audience. And why call me? Since I am sure I'm not the only person you know who's in darkness, call one of your immaculate high school friends or something. <laughs> Sistrin, if the revolution ever going to happen, it must, you hear me? It must begin in the home first. So Trent's home free already? Everything is not about tea, Nina. 
I have my own life too. Of course, everything is about Marcus Garvey. <laughs> Where do you think your life going? All you black people running around like headless chicken and don't even know why you're directionless. You read Soul and Ice? How much I can bet you never read Soledad, brother? How Europe underdeveloped Africa? Well, you were always the bookish one. Well, book is for wisdom, also for foolishness. The problem with that book is that you never know what it's planning to do to you until you're too far into it. I really need to take a shower. For why? You don't have nowhere to go. And why you don't go fuck yourself, miss? I couldn't breed for Che Guevara, so I went take whatever revolution I can ride. It reaches the very tip of my tongue and vanishes like a sugar pill. I tell myself that I tolerate Kimmy because she could never survive me even once talking to her the way she talks to me. I hate people like that. People you have to protect while they keep hurting you. Deep down, she's still the same girl who wants more than anything for people to like her. The only thing she wants more than that is to go back and be born poor and struggling so she can feel entitled to hate everybody who lives in Norbrook. But one day, she's going to push me too far. I keep telling myself, I don't have time for her. But I went with her to one of these 12 tribes gatherings. Can't remember when. Might be the same week we went to the party at the singer's house. The whole way, the whole trip on the way, she's talking loud, shouting over the engine of a Volkswagen about what I'm supposed to do and what I'm not supposed to do and how I better not embarrass her with any Babylon fuckery. She shouted about how I, when I reach, I go and get swallowed by the positive vibration and levitate myself to the struggle for black liberation, the struggle for Africa and the struggle for his imperial majesty. Or maybe me already trapped in iniquity to get swallowed by anything positive because Rastafari must begin with a fire. A fire deep down inside you that you can't quench with a glass of water. And you can't wait till it seep out your pores like sweat. You have to tear your mind open and let it rage out. That might be, high, that might be heartburn, I say. The last joke of the night. She gave me that, I expected just a little more from you look that she either inherited or studied from mummy. It's a good thing you dress like a righteous woman at least, she said, at the most boring outfit I could find, a long purple skirt that brushed my ankles when I walk, and a white shirt that I tucked in. Slippers because I can't imagine Rastafarians liking their women to be in high heels. I can't even remember why I agreed to go. Far as I know, I didn't. But Kimmy was acting like she had a quota to fill, like those church cult boys on a university campus. But people funny boy. When we get to this gathering on Hope Road, in a house that looked like slaves used to get whipped right outside, Kimmy is quiet. The whole ride over, she couldn't stop yapping, and once she was there, she turned into a nun with a silence vow. Rast Trent was already talking to a woman, excuse me, daughter, and smiling more than he was talking, stroking his beard and tilting his head left and right, while the girl, white but with a Rasta cap, Clasp her hands and looks like she's saying in a heavy American version of, I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> Me? I'm so happy to watch Kimmy make sense of it all. To watch her fidget and lean on one leg, then the next, wondering if she should walk over there or leave or wait for him to notice her. All the time she's silent. All the women were silent except the one talking to Trent. Far off in the corner, three women are lit up by a bonfire they have going, cooking some idle food, whatever. I'm stiff, a lighthouse, looking left to right. I couldn't help it. I'm already looking for boys, and especially girls from my high school, who found the true light of Rasta, but are really here just to give their uptown parents grief. There's just so much sex you can have with a man who doesn't use deodorant. Maybe to really, a lot of women here, but they're all moving. It takes me a while to see that they're all getting something to give the men. Food, stool, water, matches for their weed, more food, juice, livication and liberation, my ass. If I wanted to live in a Victorian novel, I at least want men to know who know to get a decent haircut. <laughs> Kimmy was still beside me, still fidgeting, a different woman from the one who spent the entire car ride acting like she's better than me. Sort of like what she's been doing for the past seven minutes. Channeling emotional energies towards constructive racial interests, mass sacrificial work through education in science and industry and character building, stress on mass education and, and you listening to a word I'm saying? Huh? What? What? Sorry, I was trying to swat a fly.
A fly? What kind of nastiness swirling in your bed? I'm not in bed, Kimmy. Should I even be calling you that? I thought restaurant would have given you something other than your slave name by now. Him, him call me Mariama. But that is just between him, me, and who free. Oh. That don't, that don't mean you until you choose to be free, sister. So now that you're free, you're going back to Africa? Typical. Same thing T said. Back to Africa is not even the chief aspect of the Garvey philosophy. Kimmy would never use words like chief aspect. Come to think of it, neither would Ras Trent, who probably spells data D-A-W-T-A in order to use fewer letters. <laughs> the more Kimmy dances around an issue, the more it must be truly bugging her. You called me for something other than a history lesson, Kimmy. What are you talking about? I, I tell you, revolution have to start in the home first, not the bed. Same thing. I want to tell her that I'm sick of being the one person she feels she can talk down to. I really do. And then she says, use a dirty little hypocrite. Finally. Pardon? You, you, you fuck him? What are you talking about? You think nobody was in way to see you? Lay lay around him house like groupie. I don't know what you're talking about. Shelly Moo Young said she was sure she'd drive past a woman that looked like you hanging outside him gate yesterday afternoon when she went to pick up her kids. Hmm. A brown girl in uptown. Of course, nobody else looked like me. When she passed back with the children, she see you again. You spoke to your mother? Me know that. You fuck him. Fuck who? Him! <coughs> that is none of your... Oops. Losing my voice. <coughs> ah! Don't mind me. You can go to that page. <coughs> okay. It'll come back eventually. It's all the swear words. <laughs> so, <coughs> so she says, him, that is none of your, so it's true. No, you lay waiting him like prostitute. Kimmy, you don't have other things to do. Like tell your mother that is a shit stim that beat up her husband. Nobody beat up daddy. That's what restaurant tell you? Or him tell you that is Babylon do it. Go on and tell me. Tell me what him tell you. Because you sure as shit don't have an opinion for yourself. What? What? Nobody, nobody, consider, nobody rape mommy. Nobody bob daddy. Nobody rape. Considering that I'm sure restaurant, restaurant just hold on and take away with you. How the fuck would you know? Him, him was only trying you out, you know. Trying me out. Trying you out because him still can't forget me. Kimmy, most people forget you within minutes of meeting you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pity mommy and daddy don't know you such a fucking bitch. No, but they probably know that you still there with Rasta. I have to work. You don't have no fucking job, but you do. And why don't you go back to it? Restaurant shit up bat you probably need to wipe. <laughs> you, you's a wicked bitch. You's a wicked bitch. Usually... I let her berate me until she runs out of breath. But I went too far this time. I shut up because I know I want to go further. And, and the only reason fuck you was to see if good loving run in the family. So I'm going after mommy next. T tell me about you. T tell you everything. You haven't had a single thought for yourself in two years. You hear yourself? Calling me about bumba clap Marcus Gavi like he's a history teacher. The restaurant sits down like a fucking four-year-old and tell you a little history and you think, hmm, who can I talk down to and make me feel bigger than somebody? And as usual, you call me. Well, I don't care about your history lesson. I don't care about Garvey. I don't care about your fucking Rasta boyfriend who probably sucking pussy when he go to New York. And another thing, if you think that redskin asshole ever going to help you get a visa, you're even dumber than that Ganja University t-shirt you always wear. I want to go on. I have things to do, but I go on. I have two parents who are sitting ducks just waiting to be attacked again. I am so ready to go that I don't care if I start to burn bridges, even, if I, even before I cross them, even if it's my fucking sister. I want to go back to Hope Road and just stand there by the gate and scream and scream until he either opens the gate or calls the police. And if he calls the police, I'll just spend the night in jail and come back out and scream again. He's going to help me, damn it. Because if I could help myself, I wouldn't give a fuck about him and his Midnight Ravers song either. 
I need someone to give me money, enough money so that I shut up, enough money that I got to the US embassy through the back door and leave with three visas because Kimmy won't want one and fuck her. Fuck her, fuck her, fuck her. There's at least 10 more years stuck in the back of my mouth. I'm finally letting it out and fuck all who don't care. I want to spit in her goddamn face. I want to explode all over her bumbo pussy rascal at ears. But she hung up. All right, let's do two quick ones before my voice totally disappears. Oh, let's read. Let's hope I find it. I'm gonna read two final things if I can find it. So one of the characters in the book, these are the last two. One of the characters in the book, his name is Josie Wales. And Josie Wales starts out being the second in command of the Kingston slum, Copenhagen City. And he basically becomes the overall Don. He becomes so important that whenever anybody important comes to Jamaica, they almost have to pay tribute. So um, this is him after, this is after the assassination attempt. And a lot of people are very pissed off that he didn't kill the singer. And um, it's also around the time when the PNP and JLP eras are in a peace treaty. And Josie Wales is not having any of it. So he's kind of sometimes too smart for his own good. But this is him. Let me see if I remember. This is him actually sort of playing stupid. So in this scene, he is, he is visited by the new CIA attache, Mr. Clark. Because Josie Wales is the type of person where if you're CIA, you have to know who Josie Wales is. So says, when the old American leave for Argentina in January... A new one come and take the spot. New American song, same old lyrics. He called himself Mr. Clark. Just that, Mr. Clark. Clark just ditched the E. He think it was funny. So every time he meet, we meet up, him say, Clark just ditched the E. He already know Dr. Love, but then it seems every American who walk around Kingston in a sweaty white shirt with a tie open know Louis Hernan Rodrigo de Las Casas. April 1978, and we're at Morgan's Harbor, the hotel for white people over in Port Royal. We're looking over at Kingston from the almost empty restaurant. Well, they were looking. I was watching. Me with two foreigners who are already feeling the pirate spirit take over them. It's a thing to watch, the kind of feeling that take up a white man every time you take him to Port Royal. You wonder if it's the same spirit that leap in them as soon as they land on any rock. I'm betting it is so from as far back as Columbus and slavery. Did Blackbeard ever, Blackbeard ever pillage and plunder these parts, matey? Me only know about Henry Morgan, sir. Also in Jamaica, matey's a woman you have that is not your wife. <laughs> oh, oops. It was a long time since I chat bad on purpose. So much so that Dr. Love had to translate two times. At least this one wasn't like Louis Johnson holding that memo upside down and pretending to show white people that nigger can't read. Something I still remember. But then he say, you poor precious people don't even know that you're on the very verge of anarchy. Me not understand. If we're precious, oh, we're poor. Diamond precious. But that's what you are, my boy. A diamond in the rough. So rough this island. So roughly cut and beautiful. And so precarious. <clears throat> By precarious, I mean that you're teetering on the edge. By teetering, I mean that precarious? Yes, exactamente. Exactamente. Isn't that right, Louis? Louis and I go back a ways. Too far back, it seems. Really? You part of that Bay of Pigs flop show, too? What? But no, no, that was before my time. Way before my time. Well, maybe one day you people find a poison that really work on Castro. <laughs> you're a perceptive one. Cutting, eh? Has Lewis been feeding you the news? No. The news has been feeding me the news. Hold on now, Josie Wales. Nothing throw these Americans off more than when they realize that they were wrong about you. Remember to say at least one no problem, man. And vibrate the man like this. No problem, man. Before he drive away. Just so he leave thinking he find the right man. I wish I had dreadlocks right now so I could break into jogging on the spot and land on one foot. But I spent the whole time watching Dr. Love nodding at everything this man say. 
I almost forget that for most of the time he was trying to tell me that Jamaica is at war. A bigger war than 1976, he say. The Cold War. Do you know what they mean by the Cold War? War don't have no temperature. <laughs> what? What? Oh, no, son. Cold War is a term, a figure of, hmm, it's just a name for what's happening here. You know what? I got something right here. Here, look at this. The white man take out a coloring book. When you keep playing fool with Americans, you learn to expect anything. But this one throw even me off. I want this. I had it upside down because who need to flip around the cover to read Democracy is for us in the title. The American look at me holding the book wrong and I know exactly what he's thinking. It's a breakdown. That's what it is. L Louis, th does he know what I... I mean, look, may I have it for a second? Thanks. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Ah, pages six and seven. See on page six, this is the world in a democracy. See, people in the dark, in the park. Children running down the ice cream truck. Maybe somebody over there is grabbing a Twinkie. Look, see that guy reading a newspaper? And watch that chick, hot, right? Wearing that miniskirt. Who knows what these kids are learning, but they go to school. And every adult in this pic, they can vote. They decide who should leave, I mean lead, the country. <laughs> oh yeah, look at the tall buildings. That's because of progress, markets, freedom. That's the free market, son. And if anybody in this picture doesn't like what's going on, they can say so. You want me for color the picture, boss? <laughs> what? No, no, no. I'll tell you what. Say I give you a couple dozen for that school you got. We've got to get the word out to the young before these fucking pinko commies recruit them. Fucking freaks, these commies. You know why so many of them are faggots? Because normal people like me and you, we reproduce. Commies, they're just like homos. They recruit. Or any American church that come here, I think, but don't say. Instead, I say, true thing, boss. True thing. All right, one final thing, and then we do some questions. So... That was sort of the adventures of Americans in Jamaica. So this is a Jamaican in America. Her name is Dorcas Palmer, and she's looked, she, she, she um, is a caregiver. What only thing you need to know about her is that it's 1985 in New York, and her name is not Dorcas Palmer. You know how them gals stay? Come all the way to America and still go in and let them is some dirty whore from Gully. Me tired of them girls so till. Me just tell this one nasty slut who working for me sculptors. Nasty slut, me say. As long as you're working for this year job and living under that there roof, you better lock up that pum pum, you understand me? <laughs> lock up the pum pum. Of course, the bitch never listen and know she's pregnant. Of course, Miss sculptors have to let her go. On my recommendation, of course. Can you imagine some little stinking bottom nigga picnic and run rapid round the place on Fifth Avenue? No, Baba. The white people would have one of them white people things. I can niche and tarated. <laughs> so does she go by Miss Calters or Ms. Calters? So does she go by Miss Calters or Ms. Calters? What are we a used to us? Them going like you quick. Boy, sometimes you never know which. Soon as she start read some magazine named Ms. She says she named Ms. Calters, my love. Me just say, ma'am. Ma'am, like some slavery thing. For once, she looked like she didn't know the answer. It's three years now I'm with God Bless Employment Agency. And every time I come in, she has a brand new story about some ghetto slut who got pregnant on her watch. What I don't understand is why she always feels like I'm the person to, to tell these things to. I'm not trying to be understanding or empathetic. I just want a fucking job so that my slumlord doesn't kick me out of my top class fifth floor walk up with a toilet that makes all sorts of murder sounds when you flush it and rats that just feel they can sit up on, on the couch and watch TV with me. Trying to use them slavery word around the cultures. New York people who live on Park Avenue, very antsy about them kind of remark. Oh. At least you have one of them Bible names they love on a Jamaican. Me even get a man one of them job last week. Can you imagine? Probably because him named Hezekiah. Who knows? Maybe them think that nobody with a name from the good book going teeth from them. You're not no teething girl. She asks me this every week I come to pick up my pay, even though I've been here three years. But now she looks at me like she really wants an answer. The Calters aren't the usual clients, clearly. 
Where's my 10th grade teacher now to tell me to tell me what doors I've opened in my life just from knowing how to speak correctly? Miss Betsy's looking at me. Some jealousy, sure. Some envy, too, because I have what beauty contestants call deportment. After all, I am a high school edu educated girl from Haven Hill, St. Andrew. Pride, of course, because she has somebody she can finally use to impress the Calters, so much so that she can probably trump up some false bullshit on the last girl just to get her fired. But pity, too. She's wondering how a girl like me come to this. No, Miss Betsy. Good, good, wonderful good. Don't ask me why I was walking on Broadway past 55th, because not a damn thing was going on on that street or in my life. But sometimes, I don't know. Walking down a New York street, it doesn't make your problems easier. It just makes you feel like you can just walk. And, that I have, and not that I have problems. Actually, I don't have a thing. And I'll bet anybody that my nothing is bigger than their nothing any day of the week. Sometimes having nothing to worry about makes me worry. But that would be some psychological bullshit to make me feel busy. Maybe I'm just bored. And that meant walking. Even though I know it don't make any sense, though it explains why these people never stop walking, even to somewhere you can get to on the subway. You really do wonder if anybody works in this city. Why are there so many people on the street? So I was walking from Broadway to 120th. I know there comes a point when you're walking that, that you've walked too far and there's really nothing to do but continue. Until what, I don't know. I always forget until I find myself walking. And besides, it was only a few blocks before Times Square. And Lord knows you only need 10 minutes in Times Square to miss a quaint little place like West Kingston. Not like I'd be caught dead in West Kingston. Anyway, walking down Broadway past 55th Street and looking out for freaks, flashers and everything I saw on TV but never see here. The little sign was failing to stick out between two Chinese restaurants on 51st. God bless Employment Agency which was enough to make it clear Jamaicans run it. But if that didn't do it, then the proverb at the bottom of the sign, a soft answer turneth away wrath, which didn't have a fucking thing to do with anything, certainly did. The only thing left was to add international in the title. But I had some nerve thinking I could talk down to a place that existed to help losers like me. After all, there were only so many times you could call your American ex in Arkansas and ask for money to help before he said, Fine, I'll send you some cash, but if you ever call my house again and threaten to talk, my, talk to my wife, I'll make a little call to the INS and you'll see if I don't find your conniving nigger ass on the next fucking flight back to Jamaica, clutching one of those clear plastic bags I give deportees so that everybody know which brand of panty shields you use. I didn't want to tell him that the word nigger didn't have quite the same kick he was counting on, nor bitch, nor cunt, since Jamaican girls don't respond to none of them things. But yeah, I was in no position to walk past anywhere called Employment Agency. His last gift was running out. You know why I'm giving you the job? Because you is the first girl to come in here with manners. Really, Miss Betsy? We've also had this conversation before. She runs an employment agency that places mostly black women, mostly immigrants, into these posh houses to take care of their very young children or very old parents who, news to me, have the very same needs. In exchange for us putting up with whatever shit, sometimes literally shit, they don't ask questions about immigration or employment status. So everybody wins. Well, two people win. I just collect the money. I don't know. It's one thing when you ask for your boss for cash, but it's something else when the employer is only too happy to give it to you. The first client she sent to me was a white middle-aged couple in Gramercy, too busy to notice their weak mother smelling like cat shit and talking about these poor boys on the USS Arizona. She was in a room by herself with a thermostat set at 50 degrees at all times. The first time I met the couple, the wife didn't look at me at all and the husband looked at me too long. Both were all black and the same black round glasses like John Lennon. She just said to the wall beside me, She's in there, do what must be done. For a split second I wonder if they expected me to kill the woman. <laughs> and what woman? In the room was nothing but pillows and a bed sheet heaped up on the bed. I had to come in closer to see where the little, a little old woman in the middle of the bed. The piss and shit nearly made me walk out until I remembered that money orders were done coming from Arkansas. Anyway, I lasted three months and it wasn't the shit. There always comes a point when you're living in a house with a man, 
when he started to think he can walk around with no clothes. <laughs> the first time he did, he do it, I could tell he was really hoping I would be taken aback, but I just saw another old person to nurse. <laughs> the fifth time he said the wife was gone to her mother of veterans meetings, and I said, so you need me to figure out where you misplaced your drawers? <laughs> the seventh time, he jiggled it in front of me, and I, started so lo I laughed so loud I hiccuped. The mother in the roof started shouting, what was the joke? And I told her, hey, I didn't care. She laughed too, saying his father was just the same, always putting on a show even when nobody bought any seeds. <laughs> From that day, the mother was always sharp around me. She even developed a little sass, too much sass for cocky jiggler. I quit before he fired me, and I told Miss Betsy that while I will scoop up any load of shit, I will have nothing to do with a withered penis. She was impressed that I managed to stay in standard English the whole time, even when I asked if this was a whorehouse with granny care as a fringe benefit. <laughs> it must be immaculate high school you come from, she said. Holy childhood, I said. Same difference, she said. We'll stop there. <laughs> so, thank you. I have dragged Rastafarians, Immaculate High School, Holy Childhood, <laughs> everywhere named God Bless. <laughs> so this is the Q&A part. Do you have any questions? I can ramble awkward stuff. <laughs> oh my God. You mean for all that American? Uh, I spent a long time trying to get that Brooklyn accent right. Um, uh, it's funny because it's it, lang to, to, to open to, to a question about language because I remember when my uh, when Jen Martin, my publicist, was selling this and she was selling everybody. It's a book with seventy-five narrators, many in Jamaican patois, stream of consciousness, and you're gonna love it. I'm like. Even I don't like that description. <laughs> uh, but it's, it, it's, it, it can be, I've never, it's funny, because I've, I've never really had problems with language here. Um, certainly not with American readers. British readers sli it has been slightly different. One of the things, the British version of this book is actually pretty different. For one, you British people just have to have their Oxford comma. They just need it. So they, <laughs> I deliberately took commas out of the book and they're all back. It's like, I said a comma, Harold, comma, where are you going? And I was like, I'm never reading from this version of the book, but I'm glad it's there. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. But I have some, like London Stanley, there are two different versions of that book. The British version and the American version are very different. Well, so, questions? I'm a teacher, I'll just point. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I have a question about um, archetypes, mm -hmm. Caribbean archetypes. Yeah. Right? Uh, you alluded to something about that when you were talking about Ed uh, mm -hmm. comment about it. Can you talk a bit about um, our difficulty as, as Caribbean writers <coughs> to move from the general to the particular, from the archetype to the individual, from yeah. the, the socio sociological to the psychological? <clears throat> I think part of the problem with, with the archetypes is that we feel our only options is either to embrace them or reject them. And I think sometimes rejecting them outright can be just as bad. Um, I got into this debate when I, I was talking at Edinburgh, the Edinburgh thing and I was like, I was basically saying death to mass Joe. You know, the poor but proud Caribbean farmer. And, and Kai was like, but that per but Master Joe exists. Why kill him? And, and, I, and I thought about it that I think the problem is not necessarily the archetypes. It's our, it's our fear or failure to complicate them. Because Master Joe is still out there, but Master Joe had a really horrible day yesterday. And Master Joe actually does wonder about his damn existence. And, um, and that I think that what, 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 I think what we need are more complicated characters, which can sometimes embrace those archetypes and sometimes not. I think um, 
because there are a lot of these characters in my book and that was actually something I really actually had to take head on because I didn't want to be just the next person writing about gunmen and the next person writing about women only in the context of men and the next person writing about politics and blah 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 and at, at one point I thought the solution is to just not touch them at all and I think the, 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 and then I realized that, that maybe the, pro, the, 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 the thing to do is to complicate them, is to give them inner lives. Everybody has inner lives. It's to take them in directions, even whether you're going with an archetype or not, that you would normally have gone, or where you would have gone, but complicated. There are some people who do, there is the poor but proud farmer. But you know, feeding costs a lot of money. They have to make decisions. It's, um, I think one of the ways forward, I think, is paying attention to, sometimes you can, I think, sometimes I think you, as a writer, we may learn more from, say, reading Mrs. Bridge than reading, say, My Father, Son, Son, Johnson. Um, that going back to those sort of um, realizing that everybody, every family, everybody has had these quiet dramas. And I think in some ways that that's certainly the direction where I think I want to go next. You know, I kind of want to do a Mrs. Bridge, you know, or even a Vox. Uh, and I think that 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 you can actually still grab those archetypes and drag them through that or reject it completely. I think that we think we have only I think the problem with archetypes is we think we only have two options. And I think there are a lot more than that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I was going to ask you what, if you could expand on that even further as to why we think um, there's a fear to complicate the mythology. But you think mm -hmm. that it's actually that there's a belief that there really is only... There really yeah, is. I, I, yeah. Um, I was talking to... Uh, it was, we were talking... I'm trying to think of... Get the, the conversation right. Because um, Ben Aukri... Um, had an article out a few months ago about the sort of, sort of sort of mental colonialism of the black writer, the African expatriate, and I thought, what a great point ruined by such a shitty essay. <laughs> and me and I was at a I was at, we were, me and, I was at a discussion. Me and Salman Rushdie, and we we're talking, and we said, and it's a shame because you know, I actually do feel kind of colonized. I actually do feel as a Jamaican writer, as a black writer, as a diaspora writer, as a Caribbean writer, that there are these four or five stories that, I simply, that I'm only allowed to tell. And that I did feel, I did feel colonized. I did feel that sort of kind of narrative slavery. I did feel it. So I'm like, Akri, I'm feeling you. And then his solution is, let's just read the Renaissance. You know, let's go, let's, let's find out what the Borgias are doing and, and read some good European medieval bullshit. It's like, um, but again, the, the, the idea that, that you, you, the, 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 the story universe is wide, you know, is wide open. And that's something I think I had to both unlearn that as a writer, these aren't the only stories. And the funny thing is, that's what helped me write what could have been a typical story, because these are still, to go back to Daniel's point, a lot of my characters are archetypes, in a way. But that gave me the freedom to go back to those people and actually, again, complicate them, or just reject them entirely. A lot of this book, um, this book, if anything, this book is in the shadow of the Cold War. And that was a lot of fun to write about. It was a lot, it was a lot of fun to talk about Iran in 1979 and CIA directors and the names that show up in Paraguay or the names that show up in Kingston and the names that show up in in the Republic of the Congo and sort of going you know far and wide but also at some point in writing this book I kind of had to just put blinkers on and go you know what I'll just keep doing it until somebody says stop <laughs> that really was because it's uh, I, I I, I mean, I have, I have the mental blocks, and a lot of this book was a struggle to go past it. Um, I mean, I, I keep talking about Virginia Woolf, but damn, Mrs. Dalloway was a lifesaver. Because, uh, you know, reading, just going back to that, that's what sort of freed me up to write, like, stream of consciousness chapters, and, and um, you know, have my character getting her own damn cut flowers herself. And so... <laughs> Uh, so it's it's uh, it's 
to, 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 be, to come around a point that I'm going all around the universe with, I sort of, one, had to sort of lock myself away from judging myself and my own writing. And also kind of had to read my way out of it. Because my reading library when I'm writing is sometimes up to 20, 30 books. And just keep, oh, I can't do that because that person did that. Yeah. Yes. And then. Uh, someone who's watching from Trinidad mm -hmm. uh, wanted me to ask you this question. And, and it falls into that whole category with the archetype. Mm -hmm. Do you have a theory of violence? Do you, like, how do you approach, what is your approach to violence in your work? Mm -hmm. Because no, I've, I've read a lot of it. Um, I swear my next book won't like, actually will have violence. Um, it's weird. Uh, part of it, is, you know, growing up with two cops as parents and, um, and not understanding it, but being a part of the political culture of the 70s, violence be becomes something that was sort of commonplace. Um, my, the, 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 the one stipulation I have with violence in fiction is I think violence should be violent that it's not, it's not, it's, this is one reason why I sometimes can't stand PG-13 films. Um, I think if you overdo it, you, you do fall into a pornography. But I think that, I hope I don't fall into that, but it's something that does fascinate me, just, not just violence, but the consequences of violence and, the, and, 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 and even the, the, the culture of it. Because more than the... Even taking away the plot to kill Marley in the book is still a very violent book. And people do a lot of cruel things to each other. And some of that is tied into a very, we can go as far with the, 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 the colonial context as we have. I mean, um, in some ways, as a crown colony, Jamaica was as violent as, as the Belgian African republics, Belgian African colonies rather. So our, in, in some ways, our col colonial period was just as violent as slavery. And I think the idea of achieving aims by, by visiting harm on somebody is something we were taught. And it's a way in which it's part of the, even the birth of the country and some of the, the, the countries in the Caribbean. And it's something I still grapple with. It's something that I, um, you know, I, I grapple with, that I, I try to um, confront. Nina Burgess doesn't really have violence happens to her, but it's the fear of violence that drives her away. It's the fear to the point where it almost becomes its own acute thing. What is the likelihood of somebody picking her out in 250 million people, a man who has never visited New York, has absolutely no way of ever seeing her again, but she's still so consumed by the potential of violence that it still drives her through you know, different places and for identity, spoiler alert. Um, because of the, because even when it's not, even when it's not visited on them, they still live within it. Which is why, in a lot of ways, she was a very, very important character for me. Um, and I spent a lot of time writing her role because I didn't want to just talk about the legacies of violence in terms of who's inflicting it and who's suffering it directly, but also how it goes on and spills over into people who aren't even physically affected by it. Hmm. Yeah. So I think she was affected by violence. Mm -hmm. Which brings up a whole thing about beating and corporal punishment. <laughs> I like where this is going. <laughs> yeah, and she rebels and she rebels against it because again, it's the it, but corporal punishment is a colonial thing. It is this sort of again inflicting order through. I mean, inflicting violence to achieve order. Which I'm sure a lot of people say, well, my mother beat me and I ended up being fine. I'm like, well, I didn't. Kudos for you. I still remember every single time. And every now and then I give my mother shit over it. It's like, yeah, I still remember that. I shouted out, murder, rape, police. And you go, I am a police. So uh, it's, it's, yeah. But yeah, to come back to, not to make light of it, but yeah, it's, it's um, again, it, it's, it is it, to an extent, the things we do to each other. And I think a huge part of it is part of the, so, so part, some of the Caribbean legacies we don't want to talk about. And I love muckracking stuff we don't like to talk about. And I think it's stuff we, I think we should confront, talk about, and move beyond, I think. Yeah, yes, Jeffrey. What's the difference between your theory of violence and what happened on Game of Thrones last year? 
<laughs> Somebody has been reading my rants. Where do I begin with George Martin? I'll say, I'll give him, let me give him credit before I rip him to shreds. The one thing I like about George Martin's world is one of the things I've always disliked about historical fiction is how everybody survives. If you are growing up in the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, first and foremost, you're, you, you, there, are fat, there are seven graves outside for all your brothers and sisters who did not make it. There's another grave for your brother who won't pass 15. You have four sisters, kudos. Three will die before you're 30. So, and, and also, who wrote that book again, um, talking about we're less valid now, Steven Pinker? He had a book on that. Right, so uh, in that sense, I agree with him. My problem with that, that story, and it's funny, because that rape was not written by him, it was written by people trying to be like him, his, the screenwriters, is that it becomes this sort of... Um, Things he will do, characters start to act out of character. I don't care how multidimensional you are, you cannot be a sister rapist, a child murderer, and a devoted friend. <laughs> With some principles of honor. That is, that, is, that is, you're going out of character. And I think he... Do, he write, one, he does that with characters just for jolts. Every time a character dies in that show, I don't feel it was surprising but inevitable. I just hear somebody going hee 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 in the background. And to come to, because this is a show that loves its rape. And uh, it's, I think it's, um, it's interesting that that wasn't in the book. In fact, none of the violence visited upon women in the show appear in the book. And it's, it's, I'm not sure. The thing that really, the thing that's disturbing me this week is all the actresses talking about how they loved playing those scenes. It's like, and it's, it's, it's weird. I, I, I threatened to quit the internet this week because all these men are weighing in and they're like, duh, it's the dark ages. I'm like, actually, I'm, a, I'm kind of a scholar in the dark ages. It wasn't as bad for women as people think. Eleanor of Aquitaine would not get raped by anybody. Yeah, so it's, um, I think it's, it's a lot of manipulation, and I think it's, um, I don't know if they were just going for a cheap thrill because it was Mad Men's finale, but I think it's, um, I don't know, I think it's, it's, in some ways it's insulting. It's insulting, I think it's dangerous, I think it's insulting, and I think it's, um, it's a sort of, it, it, it's, it's kind of, um, it's, I said this, it, it almost became like a video game, and video game Sometimes they play with that video game logic where you can do all sort of stuff and, and this sort of I don't want to turn into a moralizer because I'm not. But I think it's just honestly it's just shitty writing. <laughs> Famous last words when I meet him next week or something. Yeah. When you are writing this novel, do you mm -hmm. picture an audience who would be reading it? Um, not really. I think if I started to picture who'd read it, I'd go mad. I think, um, I don't know, I think you, as a writer, I think you should, you, you, I think you need to be happy with knowing you made the clearest statement possible. That this is as good as, as I could have written it. Um, if I would started to think about it, sorry, a lot of the choices I made, I wouldn't have. There are things that the novel before, in a lot of ways, is a more careful book. There are things in this book where, I mean, there are characters who disappear for no other reason than I just got bored. <laughs> it's like, I think I'm done with you. It's, uh, you know, not, this novel doesn't end, it's, it stops. Which is something I would never have done like a few years ago. I think, I don't know, I, I, I've, I would say I have a very high opinion of my audience. And which is not to say I think I'm writing great stuff. But I do think that there is an audience out there for, you know, for risky books, for books that, that sometimes just render questions and don't attempt to answer. And, um, but I don't know, I, I sort of just lock myself in that room and, and just, just write. And half of it is just, you know, having the, the courage to have those things just stay. But that's as most as, as I know. <laughs> How involved were you in the process? 
Um, HBO is bringing it to screen, and I would be the writer, probably the head writer and the showrunner, because I cannot pe let people who don't know anything about Jamaica be in charge of the look of Jamaica. Because next thing you know, the first episode come up and everybody go, isn't that Puerto Rico? And everybody including, <laughs> everybody including my mother would call and go, how are this? So, I remember there's one episode of Miami Vice and he, the, the character said just one thing and destroyed it. He was be, playing a Jamaican drug dealer and say, yeah man, you wanna know, say I was in Montego the other day. <laughs> and I saw the screen, it's Mobe, you idiot. It's like, so, so yeah. And they're very excited. I'm very excited. Um, it's still pretty early days, but yeah, they're they're um, they're really excited. They're also really excited about it being a Jamaican story. Um, usually, when you try to sell any story that's set in you know the diaspora or Africa or the Caribbean, wherever, the worry is that they just want to do a story of of sweating, suffering Europeans, put them in a, a, an exotic landscape. And I like room, you know, I like room with a view as much as anybody else. Um, but they're really interested in, you know, the stories of the, the actual characters in there. So, you know, fingers crossed, knock wood. It will be set in Jamaica? It will be set in Jamaica. At least the first four seasons would be in Jamaica. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Talk about your foreign characters. I felt uh -huh. it was really interesting when you opened up and you left. Mm -hmm. Now you have this like crazy hitman. And mm. Talk about that. What do you believe? The very first, the very first page I wrote in this book is now I think on page four fifty eight. The very first character I wrote was it was was this sort of hot headed gay Chicago hitman who is trying to kill this Jamaican but has boyfriend trouble because those things happen. You know, drama. But uh, it's that was that was um. I don't know. I stayed away from that for a very long time. And I don't know if moving to the States helped in some way or just um, being more sort of immersed or study, studying um, American culture. But the first thing I realized when I was telling a story about 1976 is that I knew it couldn't just be Jamaicans because the story of Jamaica in 1976 is way more than just Jamaicans. But also when I realized the afterlife of these characters would take them abroad that also created a necessity for them. But to talk about, I don't know, it was, it was um, one, it was a lot of fun to write. It wasn't as that natural. I actually have an American, I have a 1976 American accent dictionary, which I, which I made myself. No, I will not be publishing it, but it's pretty big. So uh, yeah, because you, you, you have to know when you can't get spaz wrong. You can't use spaz in the 70s, it was the 80s. There is a time when somebody who thinks he is cool would have said Nito, which can't be the same decade they said gnarly. So a lot of it was actually going back. You know, I've always, my secret dream was actually to switch to linguistics when I was at college because I'm really interested in etymology. I'm really interested in language. I'm really interested in slang. So I had to build that. I had to build, it's still on my computer, the slang dictionary, 70s dictionary. I had to build it. Um, because I couldn't just go in and just start writing Americans. But I also was really interested in the 70s value system. I was interested in their view of Jamaica, the sort of foreign gaze on the country and, and some of their expectations, some which I think are solid, some I think were bullshit. Um, you know, coming to Jamaica, where's the reggae? You know? <laughs> also, yeah, I kind of wanted to poke some fun at them too. Because I think... Um, the foreign voice in Caribbean fiction can be sort of very, very the same thing. It's the, the mysterious old man in the hills or the rich family from such and such. And I think I really wanted to, to I don't know, I really wanted to embody those characters. And I really also wanted to go, again, be, beyond this idea that as a Jamaican writer, as a Caribbean writer, there are only certain voices I can tell. And only certain, and even if I use those voices, they can't have interior lives and they can't have values and they can't have, they also can't have their own share of bullshit. One of the things I like about the, the American characters that I've written is to an extent they're all kind of kidding themselves. 
um, you know, my character who thinks he's going to write the great American, you know, the great masterpiece article about Jamaica. And one of the things that was a lot of fun to write is I, saw, I put his article in the book. It's terrible. <laughs> He's a horrible writer. He says something, so, yeah, at one point he says, I think he says that Kingston Street is an un unending vortex of ugly. That's a terrible slide. So even that, sort of um, throwing that and making fun of it and, and, and again, sort of complicating it was a lot of, was a lot of fun. We have time for it. One, two, none. Well, let's take uh, one last question since nobody has their hand up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was going to ask, but you kind of answered. I was mm -hmm. going to ask since you do go into foreigners and yeah. other countries, I was wondering if you take that same sort of principle of immersion into the archetype that you sort of. Mm -hmm. I think you have to, unless you fall into a sort of reverse exoticism. And um, that, the first time I had to do, deal with that was my last novel, when it hit me that I could write a whole series of one-dimensional characters and nobody would call me out on it. They'll just go, you know, uh, the usual, the, the wonderful post-colonial look at such and such, or the, so on. And, and I think it's, it, you kind of end up cheating art when you do stuff like that. I think you also end up cheating yourself. So I think you do have to, you have to... Um, find the complexity in characters. It doesn't mean they all have to be rounded. You can't have, I love Iago as much as anybody else. I think he's, I, you know, if you were to ask me who's Shakespeare's greatest creation, I would say Falstaff without thinking twice. And I've been saying that forever. Falstaff, Falstaff, Falstaff. So it, it's, it's, I think it's, it's um, I think you also have to fall in love with your characters, even the really bad ones. Or you, you, you run the risk of not doing them justice, particularly if they're not likable characters, or particularly if they do terrible things. It doesn't mean you're excusing them. I, um, I have a class on villainy that I teach, how to write villains, how to write evil characters. Um, I have my students read Where's His Voice Calling From by Eudora Welty. It's a stunning story. I'm not even going to say what it's about, but I'll say this. The story, if the story is so good, the FBI used it as their profile to catch a killer and caught him. And it was a guy who killed Medgar Evers. And that's how they caught him. They used Eudora Welty's story as a profile. Um, where am I going with this? I have totally forgotten now because I keep losing trail of thought. Huh? Yeah. Um, one of the things I have them, one of the, one of the things I have them do, do is watch this scene in Manchurian Candidate where Angela Lansbury's explaining to her son why she has decided to use him as a sacrificial lamb. And the great thing about that, that, that scene is that it brings, it, 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 um, it brings sympathy, but in the original sense of the word, not sorry, but sympathy when it used to mean understanding between us. And what she does in that scene is, she doesn't explain herself, she doesn't justify herself, she just makes it very clear what I am doing and why I am doing it. And at the very point where you expect her to come with this sort of redemptive narrative, she gets even more evil. She's like, and when all of this is done, I will kill all of them and take it for myself. I was like, Poof. Just like So it's, it's it, again, it's... um. When you get to that sort of understanding of your characters, I think then you're in a, you're in a good spot. You can't, you, but you do kind of have to fall in love with them. I can tell immediately when a writer has contempt for a character. I won't give actual examples because they will hear about it on Twitter. But, <laughs> but you know, usually I can tell. All right, I think that's it. Yes. Thank you guys for coming out. <laughs> Marlon James, please Thank give you. another hand. <laughs> you know, every once in a while I'll get a, a, I don't get on it much, but I'll be on Twitter and I'll see tweets from him and he, he tweets about his classes and about what goes on <laughs> in his classes. And hearing him tonight makes me realize, you know, I wish I was a 20 year old kid again. Able I to don't know if they think classes. so. Anyway, thank you, Marlon, for being here. Thanks for having me. And we have uh, all of Marlon's books, including John Crow's Devil and the Night, uh, the Book of Night Women, as well as the new one. So please buy plenty, and then come on over here, and he'll sign them for you. Thanks again. Bye bye. Yeah.